Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and we're in the book of Ezekiel, going through the Bible for the fourth time. We come to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 1. So if you can, get your Bible, open it up to Ezekiel. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. There you can study the whole Bible with me, verse by verse. All four series that I have done in the last 35 years are archived at thebibleversebyverse.com. All you have to do is choose, click, and listen. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Ezekiel 14. Now some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. So some of the elders in Israel visited Ezekiel. They want a message from God. Notice verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, They want a word from God, so God is going to give it to them. God wants to talk to anyone who wants to listen. Verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I let myself be inquired of at all? By them. God says, These men don't worship me. They worship idols. They got tons of things more important to them than me. Should I let them ask me anything? Should I give them answers? Now they want me to talk to them. They have not repented. They have not changed their ways. They don't worship me. They might give me lip service, but they're into all sorts of other things. Should I talk to them? Should I give them my word? For therefore speak to them. He does have a word for them. And say to them, thus says the Lord God, everyone of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols. In other words, God says, I know, I know how to handle people who worship other gods and then come ask him for my help. I know how to handle people who continually do evil and may confess but never repent. And then they come to me expecting all all should be well, all should be normal. I know how to handle people like that. So he says in verse 5, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart because they are all estranged from me by their idols. God says they don't treat me like God, so I will not treat them like my people. You can start by telling them that. Verse 6, therefore, say to the hosts of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent, turn away from your idols, and turn your faces away from all your abominations. That's where you got to start. If you want to have a relationship with God, that's the place where you have to start. You come to me. Well, this is a good place for you to start. Repent, destroy all your idols so you don't get back into it. Mean business. Seven, for anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to a prophet to inquire of him Concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. In other words, I don't care who you are. <clears throat> if you worship idols and then come to me for help, 
I'll destroy you personally. Verse 8, I will set my face against that man and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God says, I will make a terrible example of a guy like that. I will destroy the one who thinks it can treat me in such a disrespectful way. And then without even repenting, ask me a favor. You talk about an insult. Sin is insulting enough to God, but when you act as if it's no big deal and that everything should be just normal between you and God, that really irks the Lord with righteous indignation. And he continues in verse 9, And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel. So, so I'm not going to help them. I'm not going to give them a word. And if they turn to one of their so-called prophets and he gives them a word, supposedly from me, it's not going to be true. And I will kill that false prophet, prophet for doing it. Verse 10. And they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired. This is such a clear warning to not only false prophets or false teachers and feel-good pastors and preachers, but also to those who support them with their presence and with their offerings. God says that we are not to wish false teachers God's speed. And if one does, they're going to be punished right along with those false teachers because without you, they wouldn't prosper. They wouldn't do it. You keep them going. Your presence and your money keeps these false teachers going. You're going to be punished right along with them. Verse 11, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned anymore with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I be their God, says the Lord God. Don't give a false teacher an audience or the money that he is looking for. If people stop listening and supporting these feel-good modern evangelical preachers and these word of faith liars, if people would quit being greedy and quit being so lukewarm themselves and stop attending their services and stop giving them money, they would go away very quickly. Maybe they'd sell life insurance. Maybe they'd sell car insurance. Maybe they'd get a job at a grocery store or a factory. But both them and their would-be supporters would be much better off if people would quit supporting them. 12. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, stop there. So a new section of prophecy begins right here in verse 12. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel again saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness. I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. God says, if my people, or if a land, turn their backs on me to sin, then I'm going to crush them. I'll remove their food and kill both man and animal. 14, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver them only themselves by their, by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Noah, Daniel, and Job, if they were in a land like that, they'd save themselves if they were there because of their own righteousness, but their presence won't do anything for anybody else because everybody else is so wicked. Verse 15, if I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beast, 
God says, if I decide to send dangerous, harmful, wild animals to devastate the land, if I do that, 16, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered and the land would be desolate. So if Noah, Daniel, Job were there, I swear to you, they, do, they would not do anyone any good. They'd be saved because they're good men. But the rest of the sinners would be destroyed. There would be three people left, and that's it. Well, Noah's been down that road before, hasn't he? And God says nothing has changed. Everybody else is so wicked. Those righteous men, the presence of those righteous men, it's not going to save the land. It's not going to save the country. 17, or if I bring a sword on that land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it. God says, if I, tell, if, I, if I decide to go this route, I tell an enemy army to invade Israel and destroy everything. If I do that, verse 18, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only themselves would be delivered. Same old story. The presence of Noah, Daniel, and Job would not help anyone in a, in a filthy, vile, sinful land. Wouldn't help anyone except themselves. If you are righteous, then you are right with God and you have nothing to worry about. If you are not righteous, then you are not right with God. And no one but you can change that. And you better start right now. 19, or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast. So if, because I'm angry, I send a deadly disease into your land that kills people and animals. If I do that, verse 20, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. Noah, Daniel, and Job would not be hurt by the disease because they are righteous. Are you beginning to understand what God is saying here over and over again? Is it starting to sink in? He's going to continue. 21, for thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword and the famine and the wild beast and the pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. So these, God says that he has four severe punishments ready to be poured out on Jerusalem that's going to end up destroying all life there. What are they? War, famine, ferocious beast, and a deadly disease. And that pretty much wipe everything out. 22. Yet, behold, there shall be left in it a remnant who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it. God says, Ezekiel, who's already been exiled to Babylon, remember? He's, he's getting this prophecy in Babylon. So God says, Ezekiel, God says, Ezekiel, there will be a few survivors and they'll join you in Babylon. They'll join you and the other exiles in Babylon. And you will see the kind of wicked people they are. And you won't feel so bad over the punishments that I will send because you'll have firsthand evidence to know that I was right to do it. Just measure things by the Bible and you will not pity, at least you should not pity sinners who are being punished by God. 23. And they will comfort you 
when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have done nothing without cause that I have done in it, says the Lord God. Ezekiel, after you spend time with those survivors that I will allow to survive from the land of Israel and be brought into Babylon, after you spend some time with these dirty, rotten, vile, filthy, impenitent sinners, you'll know that I just had to punish that nation as I did. And God does because he is just. So the lesson here is if you're one of the many sinful instead of one of the few remnant of holy people who follow the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, right now, right now, right now, repent of your sin. Ask for forgiveness. Repent of your sin. Turn away from it. Remove from your house, from your being, anything that causes you to fall back into sin, get rid of it. Get rid of it. And don't rationalize it away. And start serving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, or you will live to regret it, or even die to regret it even more. Study the whole Bible with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Don't forget, all the way through, 31,000 plus verses, four series, going through the entire Bible. Choose, click, and listen at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you want to be a part of this ministry that has been doing nothing but getting out the whole counsel of God without watering it down for over 35 years, you can be a part of this ministry immediately by praying for me and God's Word. And also when you take a break from studying, go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That's another way that you can be a part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.